Now, the word Pentecost simply means 50. <laughs> Pentecost, 5050, to commemorate the 50th day after the exodus from Egypt. When the law was given to the Jews, to the children of Israel. So 50 days after the first Passover in Egypt, God gave them the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. And the contrast between the two cannot be more stuck. It's quite amazing when you compare what happened. At Mount Sinai, there was a powerful wind and a blazing fire. At Pentecost, there was a rushing mighty wind and tongues of fire from heaven. At Mount Sinai, the law was written in tablets of stone. At Pentecost, the law was written by the Spirit on the tablets of human heart. At Mount Sinai, 3,000 died for rebelling against God. But at Pentecost, 3,000 were saved when they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah, amen. Oh, go ahead and give the Lord a big clap, amen. So the giving of the law condemns the sinner to death, but the giving of the Spirit rebirths the sinner to new life. Pentecost was the first time the Holy Spirit came to dwell in believers, and the church was born. In the Old Testament, in the past, the Spirit came on people for a limited time and only for a task, to prophesy, to fight in battle, or something along those lines. But from Pentecost onwards, the Holy Spirit came on believers to dwell permanently in them. Now this is a big, big difference because only by the indwelling of the Spirit can we all be permanently changed to become more and more like Jesus. How many of you want to be more and more like Jesus? Lift up your hands right now. Turn to your neighbors on your left and right and say, this is why you need the Holy Spirit. Yeah. There is an amazing Old Testament prophecy in Zephaniah chapter three and verse nine. I want you to look with me, Zephaniah chapter three and verse nine. It says, for then I will restore to the peoples a pure language that they may call, they, they, that they all may call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. Now, Zephaniah 3 is speaking of the coming of the Messiah and what he would do. And this scripture here was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. 120 believers were gathered with one accord in the upper room. What did God promise to do? God says, I will restore the peoples. Now notice that peoples are in the plural, which speaks of the whole world. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came and was poured out on all flesh, on all the peoples of the world. For then, God says, for then, I will restore a pure language so that they can all be in one accord to preach the gospel to all the nations. Now, every language in the world has curse words in it, every one of them. Swear words, vulgar words, filthy words, profane words. But the heavenly language, the language of the Holy Spirit is pure. Because how many of you know the Spirit is called the Holy Spirit? He's called what? The Holy Spirit. In heaven, there is no vulgar words, no curse words, no swear words, no unclean words. Now, what did God say? I will restore. This means He's going to come and bring back what had previously been lost been taken away. So for the last 2,000 years, since the early church in the first century, Pentecost is understood as the divine reversal of the curse of Babel. Now remember what happened at the Tower of Babel, right? How many of you remember this word, or this phrase, the Tower of Babel, right? Remember Tower of Babel? 
In Genesis chapter 11, the peoples of the world, they all gathered together to build an enormous tower that will reach to the heavens to challenge God, to rebel against God. They were bold. They were audacious and very, very rebellious. And they were all able to do it because the whole world back then spoke one language. You know what the Lord said in Genesis 11? If the people are speaking the same language, then nothing that they plan to do will be impossible to them. Nothing. <laughs> when you can speak a common language, the unity you have is very, very powerful. Impossibly powerful. So what did God do? God confused their language to break their unity. You see, the Babel means confusion. So when there's confusion, they couldn't understand one another. The people split up. There was division and 70 nations were formed. Now fast forward to the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter two, peoples from 70 nations and ethnic groups were present in Jerusalem for the feast. God then reversed the curse of Babel and restored to them a common language. It was a pure language from the Holy Spirit, a language of faith. With this pure language and this unity in their hearts, from now on, nothing they plan to do would be impossible to them. Why do you think that Satan, the devil, fights tongues so much that the devil hates tongues? Because when the first church got this, they turned the whole world upside down. In 1906, when the earliest Pentecostals at Azusa Street got this, they turned the whole world upside down. So as your senior pastor, this is how I think. If I can get all of you here in City Harvest Church to speak this pure language, this language from the Holy Spirit, and to have love and unity in your hearts for one another, then you know what? Nothing we plan to do in this church will be impossible to us. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, you want to clap? Let's give the Lord a big clap. Nothing will be impossible. So notice, the Old Testament talks about Pentecost. The wind, the fire, a pure language. Peoples in one accord. And how nothing will be impossible to them. Now we go to Acts chapter 2, to the day of Pentecost. <laughs> Acts chapter 2, that's, that's what this weekend is all about. It's about Acts chapter 2. Look at what happened in Acts chapter 2. This is exactly what happened. Verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Notice, you must decide to speak, but the words, the utterance, it comes from the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit will not force you until by faith, you decide to speak. Yes. Now look, the earliest believers were all filled with the Holy Spirit. All. They all spoke in tongues. Not just some of them. Not just the 12 apostles. But all who believe. How many believers in Jesus do we have here today? Amen. Yeah? yeah? Now this is very important. 
Because the first step to being empowered by the Holy Spirit is to speak in tongues. Tongues is the gateway into the supernatural. Tongues opens the door for us to enter the realm of God's power. This is why when Jesus was ascending to heaven, he gave us this promise. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons and they will speak in new tongues. Mark chapter 16 and verse 17. Turn to your neighbors on your left and right. Say, Jesus wants you to speak in new tongues. Yeah. <laughs> Once you can speak in tongues, you will start moving in the power of miracles, of healings, of signs and wonders. This is so important that Paul will later say, I would like every one of you to speak in tongues. And thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. <laughs> so this is also my mantra. I want all of you here in City Harvest Church to speak in tongues. <laughs> tongues is a very supernatural gift. Amen. You are empowered by the Holy Spirit to speak words that you have previously not known. You are speaking words in a language you do not understand. In 1986, when I went to Philippines for the first time, I went to Lawak City, right up in the north, and I spoke in tongues at a prayer meeting, early morning prayer meeting. Five a.m. in the morning, we're all gathering, I was speaking in tongues. Two Filipinas who were sitting very close to me, they were very surprised. So after the prayer meeting, they came to me and they said, Brother Kong, where exactly in Philippines do you grow up? I said, no, no, no. This is the first time I'm here in your country. They were so shocked. They said, then how come you speak fluently in Ilocano, our local dialect here? I was speaking in a local dialect. And I didn't understand what I was saying. In fact, last week I was in Surabaya in, in Indonesia and Pastor Agus Gunawan, my interpreter, was sharing with me that at one time he was in a prayer conference. As he prayed in tongues, a Christian leader who came from the Middle East stood up and said in front of everyone in the room, Pastor Agus, I understand you perfectly. You are speaking Arabic. Pastor Agus didn't understand a single word of Arabic. Now, the Bible says you can speak in tongues of men, 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 1. Tongues of men, this means one of the languages out there in the world. But most of the time, you are speaking tongues of angels. That means it is a heavenly language, something heavenly, something very pure. No one understands you, Paul says, for you are uttering mysteries in the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 2. This is one reason why sometimes you need interpretation of tongues so that people can understand the message you're giving to them, what you're saying. But the point here is this. If you can have the faith to speak in a heavenly language, the door to the supernatural will be open wide to you. But if you can't even believe God for tongues, how are you gonna believe God to heal the sick? How are you going to believe God for mighty signs and wonders and miracles if you can't even believe God for a simple thing like speaking in tongues? Tongues is the key that opens the door. Now, why tongues? You know why? Why is it such a big deal to us and to Pentecostals like us all around the world? There are many, many reasons. In fact, I counted there are easily nine to ten reasons. But for today, I'm not going to preach long. Just let me give you five reasons why you should speak in tongues. Reason number one, tongues is for edification. It's for what? It's for edification. To edify means to build yourself up. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 4, what does it say? Look over here, it says, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 4, anyone who speaks in a tongue 
edifies themselves. Jude verse 20, Jude, the brother of Jesus, you know, Jesus, Jesus' half-brother, he actually says this, but you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Can you see this? The Bible is very, very clear. When you pray in tongues, you are building up your inner man. You are strengthening and energizing the real you, the real person on the inside. It's like you charging your mobile phone. When your mobile phone is fully charged, you can receive phone calls. You're able to send out text messages. You can download apps and operate them and use them. But at the end of every day, what must you do? You will run out of battery. You need to charge your phone again. Same thing, right? In fact, if you are using your phone a lot, you need to keep it charged all the time. So we always have a charging port at our desk. When we are driving, we charge it uh, at, at, the, at the port in the car. So that there's no break in communication. There's no break in operation. In the same way, speaking in tongues charges your inner spiritual battery. When you are edified and you are fully charged, you become very sensitive to God. You hear His voice very easily. Your prayers become very powerful. You can easily move in the other gifts in the Spirit. But at the end of each day, you become spiritually drained. Right? You face challenges. You get drained. If you don't get recharged in the Spirit, it is very easy for you to become dull to God. You're no longer sensitive to Him. You can't hear Him. I mean, have you ever heard people say, you know, I don't know what God is doing. I can't hear God. God seems so far away. <laughs> you become dull. Yeah. Then your prayers become very weak. There is no power in them. And you'll find it very hard to activate all the gifts that God has downloaded into your life. So the more you want to move in power, the more you must keep yourself edified and energized by the Spirit. So for me, I pray in tongues all the time. When I walk, I'm praying in tongues. When I go for a job, I'm praying in tongues. When I drive, I pray in tongues. Sometimes at a tra traffic jam, you know, instead of getting upset, you just pray in tongues. When I listen to worship music, when I shower, I pray in tongues. I pray in tongues when I feel tired when I'm drained, when I'm discouraged, when I'm disappointed, or when I'm worried or become fearful, I just pray in tongues. I just pray in tongues. I pray in tongues when I want to activate the gifts of, of the Spirit, to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to prophesy, to move in the words of knowledge and wisdom. Before this service today, I was praying in tongues a lot. Since this morning, I was praying in tongues so that I can be sensitive to God and minister to you a word in season. Amen. Let me tell you this, without tongues, you can be still a very nice Christian. You can be a very intellectual Christian, a very cerebral Christian, but you can never be a powerful Christian. And this is a very clear command of Jesus to all his followers. In my name, speak in new tongues. Mark 11, Mark 16, verse 17. Turn to your neighbors one more time and say on your left and right, in Jesus' name, speak in tongues. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So number one, tongues is for edification. Number two, tongues is for praise, which is the power of heaven. Praise is the power of heaven. On the day of Pentecost, the people who understood the language, they were amazed. They say, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. So these 120 believers, they were praising God. So when the two Filipinas understood why I was praying, I asked them, so what exactly was I saying? <laughs> they said, oh, Brother Kong, you were praising God. I said, what, what was I saying? You were saying again and again in our local dialect, in Ilocano, God, you're so worthy of our worship. 
Let us keep giving you the glory. And you kept on repeating that. Oh, you're, God, you're so worthy of our worship. Let us keep giving you all the glory. That's what it's for. Tongues is for praise. One of the most powerful types of worship is to sing in the Spirit. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 to 19. I love this so much. Ephesians 5 and verse 18, it says, be filled with the Spirit. So this is how you are filled with the Spirit. This is how you get filled. Speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. So one way is to sing a song that's not composed by people. With all due respect, I, I love all the songs composed by city worship. I love them. But I love singing in tongues a lot. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. So you get filled with the Spirit every time you sing in tongues. Spontaneously sing in a heavenly language. And that's the beautiful thing. The Bible says you don't have to be an expert singer. You can make a joyful noise. What to other people is joyful noise, to God is beautiful music. Yeah? In 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 15, what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. Very clear, right? Yes. You must pray in English, in Chinese, in Tagalog, in Bahasa Indonesia. This is called praying with your understanding. Praying with your mind. But we must also pray in tongues, with your spirit. Yes, we must sing in English, Chinese, Tagalog, Bahasa, Indonesia. But we must also sing in tongues. Because singing in tongues is very, very powerful. A long time ago, before I became a pastor, I was just a cell group leader. Everybody starts as a cell group leader. Pastor Yong and Pastor Ming were my secondary school friends. They were my secondary school members. I was a little older. I was in university. They were in secondary school. One Saturday night, after our youth fellowship, we went for dinner, and then after dinner, a few of us gathered in the church office at Jalan Saudara Ku at Siglap. <laughs> this was long before City Harvest Church was started. This was long before we had our first service. I took my guitar, and we sang one to two English songs. And then we started singing in tongues. And we just started singing, and we couldn't stop. We didn't want to stop. With our eyes closed and our hands lifted up, and for me, I'm just playing the guitar. The few of us in the room, we sang, and we sang for one to two hours. That night, the Holy Spirit came so mightily upon us, we went home drenched in the presence and the power of the Spirit of God. Shortly after this, I was invited by Ken Wong to go to Anglican High School <laughs> to share my testimony. You know, I wasn't really a preacher back then. I just was asked to share a testimony. So I shared for 15 minutes, one five, and revival broke out. Yeah. At that time, I was attending a little neighborhood church of 60 members, just 60 members. In two years, that little church grew to 500 people. Oh, go ahead and praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, give the Lord a big hand. <laughs> I love revivals. It grew almost 10 times from 60 to 500 in two years. This was how son came to the Lord. This was how Pastor Bob, Pastor Aris, Pastor Audrey, Pastor Chuang, Pastor Yalan, Pastor Ming Hao, Pastor Kim Hong. This is how they came to Christ. All of them were kids in all the schools there. If you really want to trace the source of that revival, I must say it started one Saturday night when Chong, Ming, and I sang in tongues for one to two hours and the power of God came. So number two, tongues is for praise and for worship. Amen. Number three, tongues is for intercession. It's for intercession. Now look in your Bible right now, Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. 
It says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Wordless groans. So you're praying, you're groaning, not with words known to you, but in the heavenly language. Now, let's understand, this word intercession means to pray on behalf of someone else. Sometimes a person may be too sick to pray, or maybe too weak, too stressed to pray, going through too much challenges and trauma. So you step in, you stand in the gap, and you pray on his or her behalf. This is what intercession is all about. I have a preacher friend by the name of Bob Harrison. Many years ago, Brother Bob was in an aeroplane flying from one city in the US to the next city. Midway in the flight, there was severe engine trouble. Everyone on board was panicking. They all thought the aeroplane was going to crash. On the ground, Bob's wife was driving in her car, running errands for the family. Suddenly, she felt a great burden to pray. It was the Holy Spirit. But she didn't know what it was about. But obeying the inner prompting, she pulled the car over to the side of the road. But she still didn't know who to pray for and what to pray. So she started praying in tongues. And she soon sensed, she soon sensed there's an urgency of the Spirit inside. Oh, this is an important prayer. Someone is experiencing danger in his life. I don't know what, I don't know how to pray, but I'm going to pray as the Holy Spirit give me this heavenly language. And soon she was groaning very deeply and praying very fervently in tongues. Now, in the air, the aeroplane was losing control and rapidly losing altitude. But suddenly, it stabilized, and the pilot managed to land it safely. A few passengers were hurt, but nobody died. When Bob later met his wife, he told her what happened in the air. And she told him what happened on the ground. When the Holy Spirit directed her to pray, so they checked the time when everything happened. It was exactly the same minute that the aeroplane went out of control the same minute. Oh, come on, go ahead and give the Lord a big hand. Hallelujah. There was no way his wife could have known Bob's life was in danger. But the Holy Spirit was helping her to intercede for him using tongues, which really saved his life. I have also personally experienced the power of tongues in intercession. When I was inside, cut off from everyone else in the world, one day, Sun came to visit me. She looked very sick, and she told me she had a condition, something I never heard before, called fibromyalgia. I didn't even know what that word meant or how to spell it. I never heard of this condition before. And being inside, we have no computers. How am I going to Google what fibromyalgia was? Son briefly explained to me, basically, I have severe pain all over my body. I couldn't sleep at night. I have memory fog. And I felt fatigued all day long. And the doctor said there's no cure for this condition. All he could do was to prescribe a lot of medication for me. He puts me in the daze all day long. I tell you, as a husband, I felt so helpless. I felt so weak. I didn't know how to pray for my own wife. But how many of you know the Holy Spirit knows everything? Yeah? You may not know everything, but He knows. So by praying in tongues, the Holy Spirit could use me to stand in the gap and pray and intercede for Son. So all day long, all night long, inside, I would be praying in tongues for son. Just pray. Sometimes I go into deep groaning. Oh God. And I would be groaning and groaning. 
And then during one visit, son came smiling, looking very happy. I could tell the pain's gone. And then she told me, she said, you won't believe it. I had a worship session one day, un unplanned. <laughs> and some of the city worship singers and musicals, they came and we worshiped God. And in that worship session, God supernaturally healed me. And I knew, I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew that God used my prayer in the spirit to bring different ones together for a divine encounter so that my wife's son could experience a miracle of healing. Oh, come on, go ahead and give the Lord a big hand. Oh, you want to clap? Let's give the Lord a big clap. Hallelujah. Tongues is very important in the ministry of intercession. Now, number four, tongues is for spiritual warfare. That's why the devil doesn't like it. Sometimes we want to do great things for God, and then we'll face, boom, demonic opposition. Look, for every great plan that God has for you, the devil will devise an evil plot against you. And when we face a demonic pushback, it's very easy to get discouraged, to become fearful, sometimes to be even angry. And in such times, the key to victory is speaking in tongues. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. Many of you know this already. Ephesians 6, and it says over here in verse 13, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, you must put on the armor of God. What must you put on? The armor of God. Turn to your neighbors on your left and right and say, you need the armor of God. <laughs> now, what is the armor of God? What is the armor of God? Look, look, look at pastor. It's made of the helmet of salvation, yeah. the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shoes of peace, the shield of faith, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. But after you put on the armor, you got to do something. <laughs> what do you do after you put on the armor of God? Look at verse 18. It says, and praying in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. What do you do after you put on the armor? You pray in tongues. You attack the devil by praying in the Spirit. And then you'll realize, boom, 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 boom. Boom. You're coming against the devil. Tongues releases the power of salvation. The power of righteousness, the truth, the peace, the faith, the promises of God against the devil. It releases it. <laughs> Hallelujah. That is why tongues is so powerful in deliverance ministry. Demons are very afraid of your prayer language because they are utterances by the Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. Finally, number five, tongues is for spiritual rest. Isaiah 28, verses 11 and 12 says, it says Isaiah 28, verses 11 and 12, very well then, with foreign lips and strange tongues, God will speak to this people, to whom he said, this is the resting place. What is the resting place? When you speak in tongues. Let the weary rest. You know what's very interesting is this. In 2006, just about 15 years ago, scientists from the University of Pennsylvania and Ivy League Uni, they reported their research on speaking in tongues. Now, these are secular scientists. They are not Christian scientists. Through neural imaging, they discovered that when Christians speak in tongues, the frontal loop area slips into low gear. This means there is less blood flow there than when you talk, when you pray, when you sing in a language known to you. That means you're not stressing your, your brain the way you would when you are speaking English or Chinese or, or Tagalog or Bahasa Indonesia. In other words, your mind is relaxing when you're praying in the spirit. So Professor Andrew Newberg, who was the leader of this research, he says that when a person prays or sings in tongues, the sense of self 
is taken over by something else outside of the person. Something outside has taken over you. And so suddenly you feel the burden is taken away. Of course, as Christians, we know this is not something, but someone, hallelujah. The Bible says that when the Holy Spirit is moving in us, giving us the words to say, in that process, He takes away that burden and we enter into rest. Rest from stress, from your worries, your fears, your shame, your anger. Amazing, right? Neuroscience is proving today that speaking and singing in tongues actually relax us and is super beneficial for us. So hallelujah. Oh, come on, go ahead and give the Lord a big hand. Amen. So five blessings. Edification, praise, intercession, spiritual warfare, rest. I have given you five great reasons why you must speak in tongues. Those of you watching online, you got to speak in tongues. Above all, it's a clear command from the Lord Jesus himself that in his name, he wants all his believers to speak in new tongues. I tell you this alone, it's good enough for me and should be good enough for you Amen. that Jesus Christ wants you to speak in tongues. Amen. 